to our Friday webinar series. As you must be aware, the Friday webinar series has been going on for a long time and we have completed nearly 180 webinars on Fridays. Basically, when we started the scheme, we had in mind that we want to bring contemporary economic issues through the best experts that are available on the subject, both domestic and international. We have been very fortunate that we have had been very, we are very successful and we have had the best minds across the world come and speak to us on varied topics and varied subjects, ranging from economic issues, basically monetary, fiscal, socioeconomic, poverty, unemployment, and then on geopolitical issues also. As you're aware, EGRO Foundation is a research-based policy think tank located in NCR region. We started our operations in October 2018. We are doing lots of work in research in terms of COVID, which is there in our public, uh, public wor uh, working paper series and policy series. We are also doing these webinars and we are also doing something on compared to financial learning, we are doing a bit on economics literacy too. Keeping that in mind that we have been talking and addressing contemporary issues, we have invited Professor Pascaline Dupas, now at Princeton, but when we invited her, she was at Stanford in the King Center and to speak to us about an issue which is very dear to us. Professor, I must mention that while we were doing this webinars, we also did for G20, for which India has the presidency. And under G20, we did for T5, which is the Think Tank 5 series on international economic order. Under the G20, there's another important issue, which is empowering women. And though we are giving the presidency, India is giving up the presidency in next one week of G20, we wanted to continue with the series on empowering women. We have done nearly five webinars on this. Today is the sixth one. We are committed to do 10, which will be done before the end of the year. Today's webinar, continuing with the tradition of empowering women, is focused on women left behind. And it is on a topic which is very dear to many of us because it deals with insurance and financial sector. Professor Dupas has worked on it. Let me briefly introduce you, uh, introduce you to Professor Dupas. She is a professor of economics and public affairs at Princeton University. She's just joined there. She was earlier assistant professor of economics at Dartmouth College from 2006 to 2008. Assistant Professor of Economics at UCLA from 2008 to 2011 and was the Lenhens Family Professor of International Studies and Faculty Director of the King Center on Global Development at Stanford University. Professor Dupas is a development economist seeking to better understand challenges facing poor households in low-income countries. Our aim is to identify tools and policies that can help improve the lives of those living in poverty. Our ongoing work includes studies of education policy in Ghana, family, pol family planning policy in Bur Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso, digital credit regulation in Malawi, and government subsidized health insurance in India. Today's paper, she is sharing with us her research is on India. To chair the session, we have Professor Bashvi Gupta. Professor Gupta is a professor at the Department of Geography, Miranda House, yeah. Delhi University. She was a Felix scholar and completed her doctoral research at School of Social Sciences, JNU, and the Center for Studies of Developing Societies, ICSSR, CSDS, DS doctoral fellow, New Delhi. Her research interests 
are centered on sustainable community, livelihoods and resilience, differential and comparative development patterns for India and African nations, gender and development, social geography, tribal studies, Northeastern India studies, and climate variability. She uses GIS and remote sensing tools in our research, along with qualitative and quantitative methods. So Professor Bashmi is chairing the session today and Professor Dupas is presenting her paper. Over to Professor Bashpi. I think that she has had problem with our internet. So I would then, I don't see her on the screen now. So Professor Dupas, can I request you to please uh, do, uh, yeah, there you are. Professor Bashpi. Professor, we can't hear you. It still shows that you are muted. Should I get started then? I um... Yeah, I think you should start because Professor Bashvi still sounds muted. Do you see my slides? Yes. You want to enlarge it? Um, all right. Let me see. Uh, okay. Do you see in full yeah. screen? Yeah, this is better. Okay. All right. Um, and how much time do we have? Uh, professor, about 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Um, and will will you uh, interrupt me throughout with questions or the questions at the end or either way works for me? What what's better for you? Well, generally we leave the professor at peace okay. and only trouble the professor at the fag end once she says she's done. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, let, let me get started right away. And I should say uh, this work is joined with Radhika Jain, who is a professor of global health at the University College London. Uh, in the UK, and we've been working on this uh, for uh, quite a while. The work I'm going to present today is based on um, uh, health insurance scheme in Rajasthan, but we uh, are also working on a similar scheme in Tamil Nadu and also in Andhra Pradesh, and we have ongoing uh, partnerships with the state governments in, in those states, and uh, uh, we are very curious to hear your thoughts as to what uh, uh, other uh, topics would be of interest within this um, broader topic of health insurance. Um, because we have, uh, we are fortunate to to have uh, these relationships with various um, state governments and, and uh, good access to data to really inform policy on this topic. All right, so let me uh, go straight into you know the motivation, which uh, hopefully you you know you are all very familiar with. Uh, but, you know, um, unfortunately, still at, at, as of uh, very recently, and I don't think that that has changed that much since 2021, uh, India is among the worst countries in the world in terms of uh, women's health. Um, so this map shows you uh, what's called the Hology Global Women's Health Index. Um, it's an index that's uh, composed of answers by women uh, to five questions, five survey questions as measured by Gallup. Uh, on, um, uh, you know, their, their perceived uh, access to, you know, uh, preventative care, um, quality of care, opinions of health and safety, and things like that. Uh, and on that index, India is number 14 from the bottom, okay? And as you can see from this map, you know, based on the color, you know, India is in the same ballpark as, you know, Sierra Leone uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is right, uh, you know, um, the, the exact same, at the exact same uh, level. Okay, so compared to its income, if uh, I may say, India is doing quite bad uh, on that front. Okay, um, and you know it, it's something that has been well established that there is uh, gender bias in the health inputs, uh, meaning that women receive uh, less, uh, you know, fewer inputs when it comes to health, and that has, uh, you know, led to worse health uh, out, worse health outcomes for women. Um, and the most, uh, you know, obvious, uh, you know, result of this that's very well known, especially since Amartya Shen's, uh, uh, you know, very influential work, is the fact that they are missing women. Um, and at this point, it's an estimate of 63 million missing women uh, in India. 
and the majority of them are adults. So if you look at the distribution, um, you know, um, by age uh, and gender in, in India compared to, you know, other benchmark countries, you see that a lot of women go missing in adulthood and, 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 and in uh, older age. So, you know, it's not, obviously something that's been, been very well known that, you know, India has been grappling with for a long time. And the key policy to reduce such health inequality has been subsidies. And in particular, since 2008, uh, throughout the country, government health insurance has been scaled up. I started with each state having, uh, yeah, having um, kind of their own scheme, and then the national PMJ program in 2019 uh, kind of like, um, uh, you know, absorbed a lot of the state's uh, programs. And typically these programs uh, provide free care for poor households at public and private hospitals. And so, it, you know, free or very subsidized care at public hospitals may have been around for a while, but you no, know, but the key uh, innovation of this government health insurance program is to make private hospitals impaneled as providers of care uh, for you know poor households at no charge, and then the private hospitals file claims uh, with you know the state insurance programs. They get reimbursed for the care they provide to uh, folks. So that's really a key you know universal health uh, coverage policy that's supposed to provide equitable access. Uh, and especially uh, to reduce gaps in access uh, by gender. Okay, so what we do in this paper is we ask the question, is that successful? Does subsidizing, subsidizing hospital care reduce gender inequality in utilization? And we're gonna do that in the context of a program in Rajasthan, uh, a program that's covering 46 million poor individuals. Uh, and we had access to all the claims that are filed by hospitals uh, over a four year period. Um, so from 20, uh, 2016 to 2020. Okay, so just before COVID. Uh, and we're going to find, just to give you the punchline, uh, we're going to find very large gender disparities in uh, not only the likelihood of getting care, but also the type of care that uh, is received. We're going to show that despite um, the policy uh, that care should be free, uh, care is not free. Uh, hospitals uh, do uh, still charge out-of-pocket payments uh, to patients, and the higher those payments, uh, the lower the female share of patients. But another type of cost for care is um, transportation. Um, it was a time cost, and it can be a money cost, and th those costs are also associated with uh, larger gender gaps. Um, so when you reduce the care cost, you can increase, you know, female usage, but um, but it does not necessarily reduce the gender gap because when you reduce the cost, you know, you also reduce the cost for, for males. And so if male usage increases too, then you can still have very big gender gaps. So it doesn't mean that the policy is not good at increasing care for everyone and increasing care for women, uh, you know, in, in particular, but it just means that it may not get you very far in terms of reducing the gaps. Okay. So if you really want to reduce the gender gaps, in addition uh, to reducing the cost, what you'll need is some, um, you know, complementary policy that specifically focus on women and on the female specific barriers that women face for care. And so we're going to try to uh, shed light as to what those uh, female specific costs may be uh, in the context of our work. And so the key insights, again, let me repeat to make sure it's, it's very clear. Uh, Universal subsidies do increase female usage of social services. So, in, you know, in our case, we focus on health insurance, but the learn the insights are a bit broader. Um, so, universal subsidies do increase female usage, but they may not reduce disparities because male benefits uh, as much or even more. Okay, so in fact, you may increase uh, gender gaps by reducing the cost. Uh, and so, to achieve parity, you require um, gender targeted interventions on top of these cost reductions. All right, so this is, you know, this is uh, now what I'm going to be substantiating with um, our empirical work. I'm going to provide a little bit more uh, context and data, although I suspect many of you are very familiar with the context. Uh, document this key, you know, facts of large gender disparities in healthcare utilization. Uh, you know, try to put structure on how we think about these uh, gaps uh, using a very simple conceptual framework to highlight the, the key types of barriers that you can think of. Um, then, within the context of this framework, think about how care-seeking costs uh, 
um, you know, can can deter female utilization and and how reducing those costs uh, can make a difference. Um, then we're going to uh, look at um, you know specific female um, uh, focused policy, which is uh, empowering women in government, and see whether that uh, helps uh, increase uh, you know in the impact of the subsidy, the healthcare insurance policy on uh, female access. Okay, so on the context and the data, um, this is the, the we're going to be looking at the health uh, program in Rajasthan called BSBY. It was launched in 2015 in Rajasthan, which is, you know, as you know, uh, a very populous uh, state uh, and all poor household and, there are, uh, you know, 46 million individuals considered to be in a poor household in Rajasthan. Um, are uh, auto enrolled. So that's one of the great things of this scheme that you don't have to do anything to be enrolled, uh, you know, just by virtue um, of having uh, a Bamasha card, a card that uh, says you're below the poverty line, uh, you get access uh, to this program. And it entitles you to free coverage of over 400, uh, so, uh, so for 1400 services uh, at um, public hospitals, but also private hospitals that have empaneled in the scheme. Okay, uh, and free care means really uh, free care. We mean that you know, it, it, if you need tests, if you need medicines, if you need to stay, uh, everything should be to be covered for you know the specific fourteen hundred types of uh, you know um, uh, services that you need, uh, and you're not supposed to pay uh, a copay, and there is no premium to be uh, in the scheme. And so initially, all the public hospitals participated, and um, you know only a few private hospitals, but you know, the program ramped up and so by um, 2020 there were about uh, you know 1600 hospitals total in the scheme two-thirds of them were private hospitals and it's a uh, you know very smooth uh, seamless uh, system for reimbursement for the hospitals after a patient has come to get care uh, the hospital files uh, a claim electronically like usually two three days after the patient has been uh, discharged uh, and then on average, based on the data we have, uh, within a week, the hospital is reimbursed uh, by the scheme for the care provided. So uh, the you know, IT on the, on the back end works uh, beautifully. Um, and this program is very interesting to study because it's very, very similar to the uh, national uh, PMJ program that came into place uh, later on. So what data do we have? Uh, we got access uh, through a partnership with uh, the GOR the women of Rajasthan, we got access to insurance claims filed by every hospital um, uh, in the scheme for every visit uh, from December 2015 to October 2019. Okay, and this data includes information on who the patient is, so you know their age, uh, their um, sex, uh, and a phone number, which is, uh, as you will see later, uh, was very useful. Uh, the name of the hospital, filing the claim, and the, um, the you know the address of the hospital and then what service was provided and at what date um and you know because this is a paper about gender and gender gaps obviously the data on the gender of the patient is going to be very important for us and so you want to make sure it's accurate so we were able to check that it's accurate by doing audit surveys where we call patients who's you know as, as i mentioned we have the contact information right so we can call people for whom a, a, a claim was filed and ask them, okay, did you go to this hospital at that date and what's your gender? And so we can confirm that the uh, gender information is extremely accurate. There's only one group for which it was not accurate, um, which is somewhat unfortunate. It's for a uh, newborn uh, and essentially uh, an infants because for them, typically the patient um, in the system was uh, put in as the mother rather than uh, the child um, herself. So this was this weird combo where you have a patient who is six months old, uh, but then the rest of the information is for the mother. And so when we realized that 98% of the infants were female in the data set, we realized, okay, it's not usable information. It's not, you know, obviously not true that every single infant in Radisson is a female. Uh, it's just the wrong gender put in. And so we have to exclude uh, from our analysis any claims pertaining to infant care, uh, which is not true. Um, we also are going to include oh, child, uh, childbirth because that's a very unique, uh, obviously, female uh, type of service uh, needed. So uh, when we look at gender gaps, it's not going to be useful to include uh, childbirth. 
And also exclude 2016 from the data set because that's the first year uh, really of the uh, system and the quality of the information uh, about uh, you know people's addresses is, is lower. So it's harder for us to, um, to match people um, to their uh, village. And you'll see that it's very important for us to be able to do that because we are trying to look at distance as an important factor. Um, so that's the data set we got, and then we did an amazing amount of work, and I should really credit uh, my co-author, Radhika Jain, for really thinking through how to do that very well. Um, we were able to geocode uh, hospital and patient location. So based on the addresses, we were able to figure out where, you know, uh, you know matching with, um, uh, with the Google uh, Map API and other things to figure out exactly where they are. So we can calculate the travel distance from uh, people's residence location to uh, the hospital they went to. And we also were able to link patient locations to the 2011 population census. Um, and, uh, and finally to, uh, you know, people's grand panchayat to be able to look at also uh, link it to the electoral histories and in particular whether or not they were reserved under um, the scheme. Okay, so that's, you know, the initial massive administrative data set we had, we complement with all of these uh, other data sets. And finally, we were able to do surveys uh, with, 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 with households, uh, but also with village, village leaders, uh, sarpanches. Um, and we ask uh, both households and uh, village leaders a number of questions, including uh, awareness of the scheme, gender attitudes, um, and the type of activities in the village to try to encourage take up of the program. So that's, you know, I'm going quickly because I have a lot of results and not that much time. So I want to focus on the results uh, and make sure we have time for questions. So the uh, first uh, main result that I mentioned um, is I'm going to show you, you know, descriptively, we have very large gender disparities in healthcare utilization. Okay, so the easiest way to do this is this figure that shows uh, by age group um, of the patients. So this is based on the, you know, the, all the patients for, for, for which we see visits in the scheme. Um, this is the female share, you know, of all the hospital visits that are filed in these claims. Um, so, and it's by age group because you see there is quite um, big differences by age group as well. Okay, so we have a line here at fifty percent. Okay, uh, that's just some some benchmark. You know, in expectation, you would think that it should be around fifty percent female if uh, there is uh, you know equal access. Now, Rajasthan, the population uh, female is not quite fifty percent. It's it's forty eight percent. Okay, because there is problem of missing women. Um, but 48, you know, 50 is not, you know, that, that uh, should be somewhere around here. You still see a massive gap, um, especially for the younger um, age groups and for the older age groups. In, uh, and we are very far from 48% of the patients in the hospital visits being female. The one, um, er, you know, uh, edge zone where the, the, you don't see as much of a gap at all is for women of childbearing age. Okay, and here I want to caution uh, that it, this doesn't mean that there is no problem uh, for this uh, group. It's just that there are a lot of visits to the hospital that are um, related to childbirth, and we are able to remove the childbirth themselves on the data set, but not a lot of the you know uh, additional visits that come around childbirth because often they are categorized in the insurance data as being a general ward visit without specifying what it is due uh, to. And so we can't just exclude them uh, because there are many general world visits that are not about childbirth. Um, but what we can tell you is that a lot of this visit that you see for women in that age group happen you know, within uh, three months of a childbirth. Okay, so we can surmise that many of it is related to childbirth, but we can't just exclude them, okay? Um, so females you know, account for 45% of visits uh, but only 33% for children and 43% for the elderly. Okay. Um, now, I, 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 uh, let me see if I have that graph. Yeah, I don't have the graph uh, here. Sorry, for the sake of time, I removed some of my graphs. But the gaps, if I did this exact same figure, but focusing on visits to private hospitals, uh, it would be even starker. Okay, so the gaps are greater for uh, private hospital care. So, not only women are less likely to be taken to a hospital, but conditional on going to a hospital, they are 
uh, more likely to be uh, taken to a public hospital than a private hospital, and you may uh, all, uh, you know, be, um, you know, familiar with a strongly held uh, belief, which uh, likely has some bearing in the data that the quality of care in private hospitals um, is is greater than in public hospitals. So uh, that's another thing to to keep in mind. And then also, if we try to plot, uh, you know, if we compare, for example, what's called tertiary care versus secondary care, uh, we find that uh, the dementia is much lower for tertiary care, which is the more advanced type of care. Now, you may say, well. Okay, this doesn't. Uh, why do you have this benchmark as fifty percent? Many women are just sick less. You know, women are more resilient uh, for some reasons. Uh, their bodies are stronger. They they don't get sick as much. So, you know, the best way to check whether that's the explanation is to look within. Um, you know, uh, to to think about a specific uh, type of illnesses or diseases. And say, wait, what do we think is um, the you know the prevalence by gender? And so for that, we are going to use um, a data set um, called the Global Burden of Disease, uh, which estimates um, you know the, the the how common a, a given uh, illness is uh, by um, by gender. Okay, and that's already taking into consideration. Um, the differences in um, the population composition. Okay, so for India, the global burden of disease 2019 dataset estimates that for something like uh, you know nephrology or chronic kidney disease, the share of patients that should be female uh, should be right around you know 48 percent uh, for this middle age group for women for this like childbearing age. I mean, sorry, the childbearing age group and also the group 50 to 69. Okay, um, and then for children, it estimates should be slightly lower, and for the elderly, uh, slightly higher because women uh, often live longer. Okay, so that's what the global burden of disease tells you should be the share of patients that are female based on what we know of the incidence or prevalence of this disease by gender, and this is what we see in the data. Okay, so there's this huge gap. Okay. So this this huge gap means it's not about the likelihood of an illness being being different. It's you know even when you take that into consideration, you you find a shortage of women compared to what you would expect. So we can do that for a number of uh, of conditions or diseases. This is for you know cardiovascular diseases. This is for cancers or neoplasms. Uh, you know in the paper we do it for uh, another three or four for which we can you know directly match. Um, I'll map out the, you know, uh, health insurance BSBI conditions with the global burden of disease, and it's a very very clear pattern uh, that that comes out that these gaps we see cannot be explained uh, by sex difference in illness prevalence. Okay, uh, and then the other fact that's very striking to us uh, is that as the um, program ramped up, so you know, it started in December 2015. So 2016 was really the first year, okay? And uh, the number of hospital visits in the scheme really increased as the blue bars over time uh, because um, of the, you know, many more pri private hospitals got empaneled, especially uh, at the beginning of, of um, uh, sorry, in the, in the middle of 2017. Um, and here, the reason why it looks, um, Lower is because we 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 don't have the data for the full year 2019. Our data ends in October, so that's why it looks like it tapered off. But it's not the case. It's just uh, because of uh, data uh, missing data. But you can see the scheme really ramped up. But when you look at the share uh, of females among patients, uh, so the scale is here now for the share. So it starts at you know 47 percent. It actually goes down over time. So as the program ramps up. And you see more and more and more hospital visits, the share female goes down. And the share of spending that accrues to female patients was uh, already uh, you know, at 42% at the beginning, uh, and it goes down to even below 40%. Okay. So when you think about the incidence of the public spending on this program, uh, less than 40% of the spending accrues to uh, women. And that's a huge contrast compared to uh, you know other uh, other countries. Um, so you know this is excluding childbirth. If we bring back the childbirth into the picture, then uh, the share that accrues to female is forty four percent. 
yeah, because a lot of the care that women get are for uh, childbirth. So even including childbirth, we are only at 44%. And as a benchmark uh, in um, OECD countries um, or in Medicaid in the US, which is a scheme also for the poor uh, in the US, it's 57% uh, that occurs to women when you take into consideration childbirth, okay? So clearly uh, we are way below uh, the benchmark in terms of the, uh, the, the uh, gender equality that we would expect. Okay, uh, so now the question is where, uh, where does this all come from? What drives these gender disparities? Um, so, you know, we can categorize the type of barriers that women face, uh, you know, in three main buckets. Um, the first one could be, well, households get lower returns to female health. Uh, why? Because women have a lower um, labor force participation, uh, or women are not that useful uh, in older age in terms of supporting their parents. So as a parent, you want to invest in, uh, you know, your sons because they are your, uh, because they are the ones who are going to help you when you're old, but your girls will get married away and won't help you. So you may have higher return from, uh, uh, you know, uh, investing in, uh, in the health and well-being of your sons. Uh, that would be one, you know, kind of like rational uh, type of um, explanation that you could think uh, about. Another um, would be that it is test-based discrimination. So households place a lower value on female health for some, uh, um, you know, purely, um, you know, test-based uh, reason. And a third uh, type of barriers could be that there are some uh, greater care-seeking costs uh, for women. And so one, again, could be rooted in some, uh, you know, cultural norm that, you know, women can't travel on their own. They require an escort, or they a special type of transport. So it's doubly costly. Uh, if a woman has to go to the hospital, it's on not only her uh, cost of time and transport, but also that of her uh, male escort that you have to, to consider. Um, or it could be that, that the supply side is biased, that hospital mistreat women, uh, or there are not enough female doctors, and it's, it's, it's pretty costly for a female patient or the family of a female patient to uh, accept having a male doctor see a female patient. Um, or it could be that, you know, women underreport their illness because, um, you know, they, 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 um, they anticipate that, uh, you know, it's going to be you know, too costly for them to, to go to the hospital because they, they should be at home making food or taking care of the children instead of, uh, uh, you know, spending time at the hospital, you know, that they perceive that's what the expedition is from them, okay? So all of these three types of factors are gonna effectively lower the household demand for female uh, relative to male care. So, you know, to see that formally, you can just write it down very simply. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, this utility function for the household, um, and you say it depends on three factors, consumption, and then the health of the male and the health of the female in the household. Um, you have some weight on consumption, and then you have some returns to male health and some returns to female health. And then you have some other, uh, you know, uh, extra term that says that you may value the uh, health of males um, a bit more, okay? So this would be reflecting the differences in, in returns uh, and the differences in, um, you know, test, you know, in test, if you will. But then you also have a budget constraint. Uh, and if you have female-specific cost, you can write it as follows. You say, my budget constraint and my total consumption plus uh, the, the money I spend on male, uh, male, male health and on female health uh, values uh, value that cost P, uh, plus this extra cost I have to pay each time a female get uh, care. Uh, as to equal to my income, okay? So if you take the first order condition here, what you find is that you're gonna have this, you know, this, the, if you if you, um, if you don't have this business discrimination and you don't have specific female care costs, then you would like omit this. You just have this standard, uh, you know, first order condition of your equalizing the, you know, the marginal returns. Uh, so if you have differences in returns to, uh, healthcare by gender, then already you would have some differences in optimal investments. Okay. And then on top of it, you have test based discrimination, which means that gamma is not zero. If, you, if, you do, if gamma is zero here, then you don't value male health more than female health for any um, just, you know, uh, intrinsic reasons. But if you, if you do, then gamma is different than zero. That further reduces uh, the relative investment in female health. 
And if on top of that, you have some female specific costs, so CF is not zero, uh, that also reduces uh, investment in female health. And so, um, you know, the, the key difference between these di different types of costs is that, uh, you know, the first two, the lower returns to female health and the preference for, for male health are going to, um, uh, you know, lower the demand for female care as long as the price um, uh, is not zero. But if the price uh, P is zero, uh, then you wouldn't see gaps. So to see gaps, even when the cost of care is, is free, uh, you need to have these female specific costs. Um, so that, you know, even if the, you know, the common part of the price P, the cost of the hospital, let's say zero, you would still see gender gaps uh, under the scheme uh, because of these additional barriers, okay? And so to, you can see it here in this graph. So you have, you know, let's say this is a, uh, standard uh, demand curve, the quantity on the x-axis and the cost on the y-axis, um, these differential returns would bring down this, uh, you know, um, the, the, you know, bring down the curve to here, uh, but when it's completely free, the cost, you would still have the same quantity demanded between male and female. If you instead, in, in, in the, in, on top of that, have um, bias or test-based discrimination, it further brings it down, but again, it's Still the same quantity, the cost is low. But if you have this female specific cost, then even when the price, the cost of care, the normal cost P is zero, you still have these gaps in the quantity demand and, and lower demand for female care. Okay, in addition to reducing this. So you know, if you have all three types of biases, and you have a demand curve for male is going to look like this, and a demand curve for female is going to look like this. Okay. So what happens uh, when you uh, reduce this uh, formal cost of care? So that's what I think of this health insurance uh, program as doing exactly that. It reduces um, this P, uh, how much you're supposed to pay uh, at the hospital. In principle, it brings it down to zero. Um, we'll see it doesn't quite do that, but it reduces it, okay? So when you reduce that uh, cost, you know, if you, you know, um, if to start with the cost was so high that no one in the household could get care, not even the men, and then you bring down the price, uh, then what may happen is that thanks to the subsidy, now men may start getting care, okay? Men may start getting a non-zero uh, uh, quantity of care. Uh, but, you know, at this level, there's still no demand for female because the female demand is below, okay? So, you know, some households may be in a situation that before no one was getting care, now thanks to the subsidy, uh, males are able to get care, but not women. So that would be a context where, you know, the health insurance scheme, uh, which is in principle universal in practice would only uh, increase the demand uh, for male care. Uh, now for some other household, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, you know, the, the situation may be different to start with. Okay. So, you know, if you, if you, if you bring down uh, the cost, you know, even, even further here, then now you start seeing um, female uh, getting some care as well. Okay. So for this house, this, this type of household, if you bring the subsidy low enough, okay, all the way down to here, then uh, or let's say you started here and you bring it down to here, uh, then you will see uh, a decrease in the gender gap because to start with only men were getting in and now women also get it. But if you're in that situation, no one, uh, no women would get it. So uh, ultimately, the impact of the program is going to depend on the composition and which share of households are in which, uh, you know, in which category to start with. But so this is to illustrate that there is no guarantee that when you bring the price down, uh, you're going to reduce the gender gaps, uh, even if, you know, uh, to start with, uh, you have um, a lower demand uh, for female care. Okay. So. Uh, so, so, so it's an empirical question, the extent to which uh, the subsidy ultimately uh, reduces the gender gap. It's clear that it's gonna, it can only increase access to care for both men and women, and it's going to increase access to care for women for sure, so that's a good thing. But then for it to decrease the gender gaps, uh, it's, it's ambiguous, okay? Uh, but so there are three testable implications from this framework. Uh, the first is that if care is not free, female utilization will be uh, lower and decreasing in care costs, okay? And so we're going to show you evidence of that from uh, unauthorized hospital charges and travel distance. Um, then if you have a gender neutral subsidy, as is the case, uh, it will, um, you know, increase uh, female usage levels, but not uh, necessarily reduce inequalities if males benefit as much or more. So we're going to use um, uh, 
uh, event study designed to look at that from new hospital and paneling, uh, reducing the distance for care. And then we're going to look at uh, the extent to which directly tag targeting factors lowering female demand uh, alongside subsidies can reduce gender gaps. Um, and for that, we're going to look at evidence from uh, political re uh, representation. Okay, so I'm thinking I need to rush a little bit, but uh, the, on the first showing that care seeking costs due to femaleization, uh, one thing that we did as part of the study, that we did a lot of surveys with patients. We called them up. We would, we'd, we'd get the data from the, you know, the claims that are uh, within a week or two of the claim being filed by the hospital. And then we would use the phone numbers in there to call the patients and ask them about their recent visit to the hospital and ask them if they had to pay anything out of pocket. And remember, they're not supposed to pay anything out of pocket. It's supposed to be free. But we found on average quite, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite serious uh, incidents of out of pocket charges. So a third of patients had to pay, uh, sorry, overall, uh, a third had to pay, and they had to pay $30 on average, um, <clears throat> which increased how much the hospitals were getting on top of the reimbursement by the scheme uh, by 35%. Um, and, you know, condition on getting care, we don't see differences by gender in how much people had to pay. Uh, but as you can see from this graph that, you know, the the, the more, you know, um, serious and like emergency type of thing you need, the higher you are asked to pay out of pocket. So, you know, if you show up and need, needing, uh, you know, a C-section delivery, you probably don't have that much time to go shop around and find another hospital that's going to take you for free. Um, uh, and so that's when you get, um, you know, you, you get charged more. So this, this, uh, uh, these are, you know, pretty uh, important out-of-pocket payments per household, and they are still there. So now what we can do is, and we can say for a given hospital, based on all the surveys we did, and especially the surveys uh, we did with, with male patients, okay, so we know the uh, how much are, uh, the, the cost is, do we see that the higher um, the cost is for a patient um, at that hospital, the lower the likelihood that the patient is female? And so indeed what these um, regressions show you is that uh, there is a reduction um, in the female share of patients in a hospital, uh, the higher uh, the out-of-pocket charges is hospital charges. So the char hospitals that tend to charge more are uh, uh, hospitals slash um, specialty that tends to charge more have a lower female uh, share of patients. Okay, this had, um, and uh, uh, we see that for, you know, women 15 to 45 and 46 and older, we don't see much uh, for the younger children. Now, another type of cost is the transport cost. So here we can do a similar regression, but instead of looking at the cost at the hospital in terms of out-of-pocket payments, we look at the distance to the nearest hospital. So if you, you know the, where you live and how far is that from the nearest hospital that's in the scheme. And again, we see these uh, negative coefficients. Okay, so uh, the female share of patients uh, coming from a given village um, is uh, decreasing in a distance to the hospital. Okay, um, so now given that female care, you know, is, you know, uh, lower than male care and, and increasingly so uh, when cost increases, uh, you would expect that when you have a scheme that, you know, uh, becomes, that the, the scheme expands and you have more and more hospitals and the distance to a, a hospital goes down, this could uh, help. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an even study and look at um, villages that didn't have a hospital nearby. And then uh, there was a big push to enroll more hospitals uh, in the first quarter of 2018. Do we see that the villages that suddenly got a private hospitals and panel nearby now have an increase um, in the share of female that go there? Um, so this is kind of what happens to um, the number of visits uh, by female to a hospital. Uh, this is an event study. So this is before the new hospital shows up. Um, this is relative to villages where no new hospital, um, you know, is unpaneled. And there is a little uptick in the number of visits by females, okay? But, you know, the uptick is actually greater for visits by male, okay? So if you look at the gender gap, it's not going to go down because when the new hospital and panels nearby is, you know, disproportionately men uh, will go there compared to women. So we can't reject it's the same, uh, but we can't reject, uh, I mean, we can reject that the gender gap goes down. OK, so that's the key you know, insight here that if you reduce the cost of care for everybody, 
um, you know, you don't necessarily make any difference on the gender gap because men uh, benefit as well. And it, it's a good thing that men benefit from this. It's a good thing that more women go, but it just doesn't um, reduce the gender gap. In fact, it can worsen it. Okay. So the next uh, and last thing I want to show you is what happens uh, when uh, you uh, complement, uh, you know, um, this type of um, subsidies with uh, female specific uh, policies and uh, you know, unfortunately, if I may say, in the context of uh, Rajasthan and more broadly uh, in many states in India, uh, there is no specific targeted effort uh, to to um, to inform you know women about these schemes. Um, and we did find in surveys that women were less likely to know about the scheme than men. Uh, but we can look at a you know broader policy that everyone uh, here is very familiar with, which is this reservations for women at the gram panchayat level. Um, and so, you know, it's a, a, as per the constitution, um, you know, mandated that uh, seats are reserved uh, for women uh, some of the time uh, in the context of Rajasthan, uh, it's random uh, with replacement, which um, uh, which company has uh, Sarpanj has to be female uh, every election cycle. Um, so this is completely unrelated to BSBY. This is something that's been in place, you know, since way before BSBY was in place. Um, but, you know, we know from previous work uh, by Chateau Palier and Duflo and, and some follow on work by uh, Biman et al. that uh, reserved um, uh, reservations for women affect uh, the priorities of Sarpanches. Uh, and affect village gender attitude. So it could be that this also help increase access to care for women. Um, so that's what we are able to do here. We exploit the randomization of these reservations to look at whether the areas that had been uh, reserved for a female sarpanch over multiple um, cycles, electoral cycles, have uh, you know uh, higher take up on this program by women in particular. Okay. So we could only access data on uh, reservation status of the GPs for three terms. So 2005, 2010, 2015 for Rajasthan. Um, so we can see if you've been reserved as a you know, uh, GP for up to 15 years, if you were reserved three times, or 10 years if you were reserved twice, five years reserved once, or zero if never reserved. Um, and then we can match you know, hospital visits to GPs. Um, and we... we uh, you know, this is a distribution. 52% um, of the um, villages for which, you know, in, in the data set were reserved once, 36% two plus times, and 20% never reserved. Okay, so we have some heterogeneity that's uh, uh, random due, due to the, the system. Um, and obviously, as you know, there's very high compliance. Okay, so the likelihood that the Sarpanch is female is 90 percentage points higher if it's reserved than when it's not. And uh, what we find is that, uh, you know, it's, it's mixed results. We find that the likelihood that the patient is female, which is our measure for whether or not there's a, a gender gap. So remember for children, it's only 33% of the visits are by female um, and it increases um, by, you know, one percentage points uh, for each uh, time the, the GP was reserved for a female, okay? Um, and for women who are 15 to 45 years old, uh, you know, we have a higher share of female because of the childbirth uh, related visits I mentioned, and it also increases by close to one percentage points for each year reserved. Uh, but a word of caution, if we look at the older women, we don't see a positive effect. In fact, for older women, it's like a negative effect. So areas where it was reserved more, if anything, there is a bigger gap uh, among the older population. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, you know, beautiful uh, picture of like all reservations for women uh, solve everything. In fact, the magnitude of these effects is kind of small, even for these age groups. Um, so it can help a little bit, but it's not, um, it's not a panacea and it doesn't seem to help all the women. So if we think of the, of the mechanisms behind this, and we did a lot of surveys, both with households and with self-interest to understand what was going on, um, uh, we, we find that this, this is not driven, this, this reservation effect is not driven by lowering the common BSB wire care costs. So having a female self-punch does not increase uh, the number of hospitals and panel. It does not increase awareness of the BSB wire scheme, okay? Um, instead, there seem to be some long-term changes in gender norms and some uh, greater investments in maternal and child health, okay? 
Um, so we, from the interviews we did with households and with our countries, we find that female leaders are more likely to uh, have regular uh, village meetings with the health workers uh, where issues of health are discussed. Um, and women in villages that were reserved report increased health worker contacts uh, and greater agency. Okay. Um, but the effects seem to be concentrated among children and childbearing age women because that's where the village health activities are targeted. Okay. So none of the village health activities target older women. And so they are uh, the ones who are the most left behind, even uh, when you have the health insurance scheme and even when you have female serpentures, we find that older women are uh, very much left behind. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, you know, when, when you get uh, a, um, both a subsidy and then uh, the female, uh, you know, the female reservations, you see, seem to be able to shift the demand for female care out uh, by reducing some of the lower female specific costs and changing tests uh, and or increasing the returns to female health. So that's all good, but it doesn't seem to uh, apply to the older women. So the main takeaways, and that's going to be my conclusion, uh, is that you know very large gender disparities persist even within uh, a universal healthcare program like the one in Rajasthan uh, for poor households. Um, and in fact, in the presence of gender bias, costs of using social programs uh, may exa exacerbate uh, disparities. Okay, so hospitals still charge out of pocket, and the distance uh, you know distance costs are there, and so that worsens the gender gap. Uh, if you um, if you have gender neutral subsidies, uh, it's not going to necessarily reduce uh, female utilization uh, compared. Sorry, it's not. It's going to increase female utilization for sure in levels, but it may not decrease disparities because males uh, also benefit from the uh, reduction in cost. Um, and so that's you know the main punchline is that you know to really dis reduce disparities in the use of social programs. Um, you need uh, gender targeted interventions to lower the female specific costs directly. Okay, and female reservation, female political reservations, is one tool uh, that's available. But you know, it 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 is not a panacea uh, because um, changing attitude is very slow. It's an incremental process. Uh, you know, you you still are very very far from gender equality, even in the areas that have been reserved uh, two or three times. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I'm um, looking forward to getting your questions. Um, these are uh, our contacts for Radhika and myself. Uh, we um, hope to, to, to hear from you and get your reactions um, over email if you don't have time to raise issues now. Uh, but for now, I'm going to uh, maybe stop sharing my screen uh, if I can find my uh, stop it. Oops, no, not the video. Uh, do you still see my screen or no? Because now I don't see the button to stop sharing. Your, your screen is visible, ma'am. Okay. Um, I have a stop this here. Professor Gupta? Yes, sir. Um, Over to you. We should close dead end by 7.15. We have still about 10, 11 minutes. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, Professor Dupas, absolutely great, great, great study. No disagreements at all with whatever your conclusions are. The methodology is extremely interesting, at least to me, because you are dealing with the large scale data. Uh, and it's very interesting that you got hold of this insurance data because it's very difficult. So my <laughs> congratulations to you on that. Uh, I, I should say that we lost access, uh, you know, after 2020. So you know, that, that's yes. why the study is, you know, it's, it's been a very important. that you at all got access to it. It is not easily available. So let me congratulate you on that also. The <laughs> few points that I could gather is what there is a little bit of a confusion. You are not stating anyway very clearly whether you have taken all the villages. That is, is it a rural based study or is it an urban based study? The second thing that comes into all this is the impact of other government uh, programs that run. Your conclusion that it is only the childbearing age females who are taken, being taken care of is actually absolutely true. The important factor here is that the special programs which run for uh, pregnant women, for lactating yeah. women, and the food support which is given to them 
through the Janani Suraksha Yojana, which is a central scheme and actually reaches the villages. The Anganwadi workers push some of the programs to the front and uh, insurance scheme anyways is not really targeted as much. I really yeah. agree with one of your uh, understandings that you have derived from the study is that only targeted programs meant for women would really matter. The leadership also, I will agree, because my own fieldwork experiences and some of my students' theses uh, submitted to uh, IIT Guwahati, IIT Chennai, actually focus whether female leadership of the Gram Panchayat has had any impact on women's health. It has not. It has really not, because once again, the understanding is only with uh, getting the government subsidies or the programs incorporating the pregnancy period, uh, pregnancy period and immediately postnatal and antenatal health care. One interesting study which came out in 2021, it has been finalized now, was the accessing of medical facilities for gynecological problems or uh, oncological problems for women especially, especially during the lockdown area time that we experienced in India between March and uh, June 2020 and in certain phase in the, throughout the years till 2021. NCAER had done this comparative study. It was an excellent study which brought out that actually across India, women's health in certain understandings just don't matter. And therefore, a, uh, investment is least. The other things which come is the difference between the rural and the urban, which I would have liked your study to have brought out even more. You have mentioned the villages. I would have loved to see a plotting of the villages and also the matching of these super specialty hospitals or the mm -hmm. insurance providing hospitals with the local PHCs, the primary health care centers and the higher level centers for specialized health care, which is available. Because distance, you are right in taking distance as a method of study, as an uh, indicator rather, distance matters. How you travel matters because always transport is not available. Proper forms of transport is not available. And women have to walk a long distance. So these are the things that I gathered and I am really in awe of the study you've done. Thank you so much for this entire study. Uh, I still have three minutes left. May I continue, sir, please? Sure, but you okay. may like to ask a question or two yes. from the audience too. There is a question from Rajasthan. There is some question from Bangladesh, but I leave it to you. You are chairing the session. Okay, uh, I think uh, these were my basic observations. My conversation with Professor Dupas can continue after this if ma'am is willing. Uh, but right That's now, right. I think it is... Uh, it is interesting that I important that I take the questions from the audience. So please identify yourselves and switch on your uh, video if possible and ask your questions, but very short targeted questions because we don't have much time. Sir has given us only till 7.15 to complete. So we have about eight minutes left. Hello, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Uh, this is Professor Yadav from Alwar, Rajasthan. Yes, sir. Uh, I heard the le lecture very carefully and uh, it found it very excellent presentation. So, first of all, I thank to uh, Professor Dupas of Princeton University. Uh, I have only two questions briefly. She mentioned that 46 million poor individuals are getting free hospital care under the health insurance program in Rajasthan. Because in Rajasthan, that scheme was initially started, Bahamasa Swasth Bhima Yojana, then it was renamed Ayushman Bharat Mahatma Gandhi Rajasthan Swasth Bhima Yojana. So, okay, there are so many dimensions of this paper, but I have two questions only. Uh, first one is, what are the gender-based barriers that women face to access 
इनपेसेंट हेल्थ केयर सर्विसेज अंडर दिस आयुष्मान भारत महात्मा गांधी राजस्थान स्वास्थ्य बीमा योजना इन राजस्थान नंबर वन वट आर द बैरियर्स नंबर टू वेर आर दो जेंडर बेस्ड बैरियर्स लोकेटेड आई मीन टू से दीज बैरियर्स आर लोकेटेड इन माइक्रो स्पेयर मैसो स्पेयर और मैक्रो स्पेयर these are the two questions ma'am thank you Pro professor gupta yeah uh, would you also like to collect a question yes. from uh, salim reza yes, before we before huh? we i think that to... will be better yeah yes sir definitely your suggestion is taken uh, mr reza please ask your question okay thank you nowadays uh, we know that there are many sector uh, we do not uh uh agree that women are uh keeping best contribution in many sector uh, like as uh, strong family bonding uh, uh, uh and son and daughter child uh, education and so many sector uh, we know that women are keeping contribution so uh, uh i know and you know that uh, it is uh, important thing for uh, whole world uh, peace making uh, uh, and uh, all uh, uh, men uh, like uh, need to uh, emphasize the women are uh, if get more opportunity women they can keep Good contribution. So it, uh, I want to say, we need to give more emphasis. We do not uh, uh, disagree. My opinion. It's my uh, side. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any other question? No. Okay. The, just I want to say, everyone, women are best uh, in their mind and. Working and family bond is strong, and we need to agree this, my this my, in this my my this op opinion. Thank you. Yes, sir, Madam Dupas, would you take the questions now? Hello. Yes, and sorry, for some reason I can't turn on my video anymore. I don't know what's going no, on. No, it's uh, okay. We we all experience yeah. glitches. You, <laughs> I couldn't okay. speak at the beginning. It's okay. Please yeah. respond. Okay, yeah, so, um, you know, the where the barriers come from and we, at which level, you know, we, we don't, we, we can't speak to the question of whether the hospitals um, are turning away women, it could be, you know, one of these like uh, uh, higher level um, uh, discrimination where hospitals turn away women or treat them badly. That's something we can't speak to because we don't have uh, data on that. But um, definitely, we, we, we are sure from the analysis we've done that some of the barriers and, and potentially most of them come from within the household. So it's like the households uh, are, the, are deciding uh, to take um, a boy child uh, to a facility, but not the girl child, or to take a boy child to a you know, higher quality private facilities and the girl child to the um, lower quality public facility. Um, that, that we know for sure. Uh, and to get back to the question about rural versus urban, you know, a main difference between the two is that when you're in an urban context, you're closer to a facility. Because a lot of these private hospitals that are impaneled are in urban areas. And so because distance is, is a barrier, you know, you, you're going to have a smaller gender gap in urban areas and in rural areas, just from due to the fact that you have more facilities in urban areas. But in terms of the quality of care, you know, it's still the case that even in urban areas where you have a, you know, a, a greater supply of hospitals and you have, you know, some very fancy private hospitals, the, the men are going to be more likely to get that fancy care and the women are more likely to get, uh, you know, the close by care, if anything. So, you know, if I do it by, by rural versus urban, you have, uh, you know, bigger gaps in rural areas by virtue of the greater distance. Uh, but you also, but in terms of the quality of care received, there's more heterogeneity within urban areas. And that's where you see the big gaps in terms of uh, the, the, the quality of care in particular. Um, and, you know, and I think that the presence of the other programs, you know, the GSY program, 
uh, could be one of the reasons why uh, you know the women of childbearing age is where you see the uh, lower gaps in terms of some of the visits. But it's really around childbirth, obviously. And for everything else, you know, it doesn't help at all. So what's what's striking to us that despite something like GSY, um, we don't see that much awareness of women of the scheme. So when they go to get, you know, when they go to the hospital to deliver uh, a baby, th while they are there, there's a missed opportunity to inform them about the scheme. Because if they, thanks to GSY, they all go give birth at the hospital, or the majority of them do give birth at the hospital, that would be an opportunity for them to learn about the scheme and to learn that they can get access to free care for other things, also to get screened for, you know, uh, other types of issues. Uh, but they don't seem to get that information because we, we see a big gap in awareness about the scheme. And if women don't know that there is a scheme that's free, uh, makes, it, makes it free, sorry, for the household, then it's harder for them to, you know, maybe speak up and say, I, I need care. Um, and a lot of the uh, and that's based on some of the qualitative work we've been doing in Tamil Nadu more recently. Uh, a lot of women seem to say, well, I don't, you know, I, okay, I'm not feeling that great, but, you know, I don't need to go to the hospital because I just, uh, I need to focus on my family. Uh, and if I go to the hospital and I discover that I have some, you know, bad disease and then I need to go every time for tests and, and, and treatment, you know, that's going to be um, uh too much of time away from my kid, too, too much time away from home, and I can't do that. And so they, they kind of like self-censor. We have a lot of women on their own saying, no, no, but I don't need the care. Uh, and, and I can, I can. Um, that's a sacrifice I have to do for my family. Um, so they've completely internalized, you know, the, the, the fact that um, their contribution at home are so much more valued. Um, and when we ask them, well, okay, but then if you don't get diagnosed for breast cancer and you die of breast cancer within five years, who is going to be cooking for your family? Who is going to be taking care of your children? Um, and and where at that point, they're like, you know, <laughs> that's where they, you know, they, 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 they don't really have much of an answer. So to us, it's more like, you know, the women have, there is this definitely discrimination within the household. Not every single household, obviously, there is heterogeneity. Some households don't have this um, test-based discrimination, but many households do. And in those households, it's very difficult for women to, you know, to even advocate for themselves uh, and then tend to undermine their own pain. Um, and then, you know, one hope is that going forward, it's going to be easier for women to realize, no, no, I need to take my pain seriously and, and speak up. Um, and you would hope that the PhD system could help with that. So if women and the uh, uh, Angarali workers and, and other uh, local health workers could encourage women uh, to, you know, um, who get referred by the PHC to the bigger hospital to actually take that up and not ignore the referral uh, and be accompanied, you know, maybe the way they are accompanied uh, by Angarali workers to the hospital uh, for childbirth, if they could be accompanied to get uh, screened for other, you know, types of conditions, uh, maybe they would be less likely to kind of like dismiss their own suffering and their own pain uh, and to get access to, uh, you know, to diagnosis care um, more. So I'm, I'm going to uh, stop here because uh, I know we are almost out of time, but if there's any follow up question, please reach out. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for a lovely presentation and an erudite consultation of what you have seen as data in your work in the field and uh, yes we could have had a longer conversation about this but I think Professor Singh is going to tell me enough thank <laughs> you so thank you very much Professor uh, Dupas and thank you very much Professor Gupta for chairing the session serving as a discussant and of course, Professor Dupas for making such an excellent presentation. Very thorough work, must thank you. Uh, I did not know that you're working on this area, uh, but now when I've read your research and I've looked at your results, I think it's a very thorough study, very good methodology and very, very rich as far as policy content is concerned. So we are going to share the study of yours uh, with our friends in the policy circle. Well, I have to make... I have to make two important announcements. I know many of you had questions, but you also know that Ego Foundation does as financial literacy. 
and economic literacy we run programs 730 to 830 and today's program is on risk management so we have to now start that program within 10 minutes i want to also share with you that next friday we have another uh, very very important discussion and that is at what rate should india be growing eight percent so here is a strategy for india's growth this is a study, a book-length study by uh, Dr. Nikhil, who is the chief economist at Oswald. He will be presenting the research from uh, 4 to 5 next Friday. So I would like to invite all of you to that session also. Also, today's session recording, and I'm sure many of us are going to see that recording again and again, because it has serious policy implications. Today's recording will be available tomorrow around noon. So I would welcome you to have a look at it and share with others whomsoever you think can benefit from the study. As scholars, the research methodology, as policymakers, the recommendations that Professor Dupas has made. The last announcement I want to make is EGRO Foundation under its economic literacy program is running special evening sessions for professionals from 7.30 to 8.30. We are today doing risk management tomorrow, the global crisis. But on Monday, we are starting with a special, special program for legal experts and legal professionals. Because as commerce is increasing in India, so are the legal issues. And IBC is taking lots of care in settling those issues. And this program, which we are starting from Monday for the next five days, then will focus on legal professionals. So economics, banking ecosystem, terminology, and how to handle stressed assets. Those are the issues which will be discussed in the next week. So we would request you, if you have friends, please share this information with them so they can benefit from this economic literacy, financial literacy programs of EGRO Foundation. So once again, let me thank Professor Dupas, thank Professor Gupta for having presenting the paper and having shared and uh, shared her thoughts with us as a discussion and others who have participated to enrich this discussion today. Thank you, good night, have a great sir. weekend. And see you all next week. Could you please Very share nice. the PPT? Thank you, ma'am. So, bye. Good night. Could you please bye. share the PPT? Uh, professor.